We're going to pan back a little bit from the conversation that we just had. We just had a conversation that was focusing, I think, really intently in, in, a, in powerful ways on our city, uh, this beautiful city and this deeply troubled city that we live in. And we want to pan back a little bit and think about democracy and populism as forces that are working their way through our country and around the globe. And to think about the relationship between the two. So what does that mean? Well, think about the democracy broadly for the moment. Think about democracy as a set of democratic practices and norms and commitments that we have. And you can think about populism as kind of a movement. And there are populists as individuals. And, and one, we want to explore uh, the bearing of one on the other, recognizing that the results are surely contested and mixed. On the, on the positive side, populism presents a deep critique of a political order and can focus uh, a bright light on a set of voices that feel excluded from a political order, and both in terms of representation and in terms of the extent to which they can exercise power in a democracy on the one hand. And then on the other hand, there's a negative components to this, ways in which populism um, will talk about the people in ways that can be racialized, that can be highly selective, and can employ a kind of rhetoric that's oppositional and divisive. And we want to take some time. We've got a great group today to talk to us uh, about these two forces, what they mean for our politics today, what the future is going to look like. We have, uh, for sure, we've got up in the front here, if, um, if Peter Roskin could come forward uh, as a former US congressman. She served for the last 25 years in the Boy, in the in the House of in Illinois, in the Senate in Illinois, and in and in Congress, um, pleasure to have you, uh, Peter. Um, Ann Richard, uh, who is the was served as the Assistant Secretary of State for Population, Refugees, and Migration in the U.S. State Department from 2012 to 2017. Currently teaches uh, at um, Georgetown in the Institute for the Study of International Migration and. We have Marco Mena, who is a governor in, um, in Mexico, who uh, in a state that's just outside of Mexico City, graduated from the Harris School in 1994. And we take great pride in, in having a school that is distinctly international in focus. Um, and uh, Marco was the very first Mexican to come through the Harris School of Public Policy. Uh, so let's welcome our, our, our panelists. So, so to kick things off, I, I've got a couple of questions that I hope we can all feel, and then we can have some back and forth if we, if we might. If we could start with just sort of thinking broadly about the ways in which populism is good or bad for democracy, how, how do you come out on this? When you think about populism as a force in our politics here or in Mexico or in, in Europe, is it something which invigorates our democracy, or are there ways in which it cripples it? And, and if you could, if you say something about what you think distinguishing features of, of populism might be in your, in your answer, just to, to get us started. Peter, do you want to start? And then we'll come right down here to, to Marco. Well, I thought you framed it up well in terms of uh, a brightness and a, and a word of caution, too. And um, I think the, the animating negative thing about populism is if it is saturated with cynicism. Because cynicism is very dark. And cynicism is not something that animated the founding of this country. And cynicism um, creates a, a, a notion that, that nothing, nothing, nothing at all can be taken at face value. And the dark side, the insidious side of, po of populism says, you can never make it. You're going to press your nose up against the glass and look in, and you're never going to be satisfied by, by this system. The inverse, though, is a sense of refreshment and a sense of accountability and a sense of a public that comes along and has that phrase that my 22-year-old says, hey, Dad, I'm just saying. And I'm just saying, this is not the way it's supposed to be working. So I thought you framed it up well. There, there's a brightness to it, but not when it's running, uh, running rampant over others. And we've got to be very careful to guard ourselves against being cynical about a process. Populism has played a role in how um, the Euro Europe and North America have responded to 
uh, record setting levels of refugees, displaced people, uh, migrants on the move around the world. And uh, Europe really woke up and paid attention in uh, the summer of 2015 when so many Syrians, but also Pakistanis, Afghans, uh, other Middle Eastern countries, folks were, were coming across the Mediterranean going to Europe. Most were headed to Germany. And in working within the administration, the Obama administration, to work with Europeans to find solutions uh, and there is no one single easy solution, but to find, to pull people together for you know, high level conferences to, to look at improvements in how the world comes together to, to deal with um, these issues. You know, why are people fleeing? What are they fleeing from? You know, what to do about the Syrian civil war, the diplomacy that's needed throughout uh, the Middle East, Sub-Saharan Africa, and other hot spots. Um, we found that uh, our alliances really started to get frayed and that populist governments in Hungary and in Poland were speaking out uh, and beating up on migrants and speaking out against refugees and calling them rapists and criminals and terrorists. And then that became part of the uh, US election scene too. So I have seen how populist governments and pop, uh, Political parties that, that latch on to that kind of verbiage can really pose a threat for good government. Do, if, as a follow-up, is, is part of what's happening here in the dynamics you're characterizing, though, that the populism as a movement forces those who are not populist to pay attention to a set of issues they wouldn't otherwise pay attention to? Or do, or you, I think they would pay attention to those issues, but it changes the conversation. So, and we were talking about this earlier, instead of experts talking to experts, uh, people who have master's degrees from the University of Chicago in public policy, looking at these issues, you have um, troublemakers really shaking things up, using really violent, um, rude language, um, you know, turning vulnerable people into the problem, into criminals, terrorists, uh, you know, untrustworthy people who have to be kept out. And of course, that then is now infused in our own domestic politics. Marco? Oh. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Howell. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Dean Baker for uh, the invitation, for having the opportunity to be part of this panel. I feel very grateful, very honored. Uh, it's a, a great opportunity to come back to the Harris School in this wonderful building this time. I would say that uh, in the early 70s, there was a big disappointment about the government's performance. Um, uh, there was a need for experts uh, experts uh, were regarded as an option to solve that problem. Um, public policy analysis uh, became a professional option to improve the uh, public decision making. Uh, experts for improving uh, decision making in government and to have a better policy impact. And it worked. We had better results in health, better results in education, better results in public finance, better results in poverty reduction. But there was an unsatisfied feeling in society. And at the same time, uh, many countries or more countries become uh, more democratic, especially in the electoral arena. And in order to win elections, uh, politicians uh, were trying to benefit from this unsatisfied feeling. So evidence is not longer that important. Uh, the truth, if you want to call evidence that way, it's not that influential in the public policy decision-making process. Um, I would say that that takes us to the relationship between 
public policy analysis and politics. Uh, in my opinion, uh, that is the problem with having good decisions to make and the practice of politics itself. So we have, um, I've heard, we've mostly heard negative here, right? That is in terms of the effects. <laughs> we've got populism uh, unleashing cynicism, derailing responsible debates about hard problems, and if I can read into what you've just said, uh, driving a wedge between the kind of work that happens in schools like this, which is trying to think hard about data and then bringing that data out into the political world to affect meaningful change. Um, Mark, why don't you get to start us on this? You pointed to a dissatisfied feeling. What I'm wondering is, where does the populism come from as a force, right? It is something which is ascendant, it was particularly ascendant in, uh, uh, in 2015 in um, Europe as a result of, of immigration, but is there something more, even more foundational that unleashes this as a political force in our politics um, that, that you can point to? What is, what, what, what is that dissatisfied feeling that you talk about? Uh, I, I believe that this feeling is uh, uh, grounded in, in, in three aspects. Uh, all of them regarded, uh, all, 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 all of them uh, uh, based on inequality. I would say that the first one is income inequality. The second one is uh, inequality about opportunities. And the third one, it's, uh, and the third one is, in my opinion, uh, inequality about expectations about the future. And I think this is a very important point because, uh, uh, generally speaking, <laughs> Uh, citizens perceive this uh, inequality as an injustice. And that is a very powerful element in the electoral arena. If there is an injustice in the electoral field, evidence is not relevant to this cause among politicians and winning elections. And that the Can I jump in on that? Because one of the things that I've been told is that if we want to break down the, the sort of very um, um, ugly rhetoric on both sides uh, over issues like refugees and migrants, one of the things people want to hear about is fairness. They want to believe that there are systems in place and that if you follow the rules, then you benefit. If you don't follow the rules, you get screened out. And so I think that's a trick uh, for us to try to figure out how to take some very, very complex issues and ad address them in a way that there's an appeal uh, to people who are worried about fairness, who feel somehow dispossessed or threatened or left out, um, and, and try to explain to them why the systems we have or the systems we should have uh, are, in fact, fair. Peter. I think that there's an element here, a social element, that is overlaying us that is a fairly new phenomenon in, within our lifetimes, and that I mean we are all instant gratification people. We are an instant gratification culture, and this is upon us now. I am at the head of this parade, but everybody here um, feels this exact experience. Let me just give you a quick snapshot. Four years ago, my father was passing away, and it became clear we had to get one of our sons home from a study abroad quickly. I sat down, I pulled out my iPhone, I clicked on an app, I had an e-ticket sent to my son three minutes later. Four hours later, he was flying back, and I thought that was normal. I expected that. I didn't say, wow, is this a marvel? Can you believe this thing? I expected it. We all expect that. Now, lay that expectation of instant gratification over a system of governance that was not designed for instant gratification. Our system of governance was designed to restrain power. It was designed to be miserable to get things done. And the United States Congress, by design, is the most passive-aggressive institution known to man. 
<laughs> and so therein lies part of the challenge. So the fairness that Anne was talking about goes to uh, the level of dissatisfaction that the governor was talking about. And people feel like, hey, my person won the election. I want this done quickly. Let me throw a founding father's quote at you. And I'm not playing fair if I'm throwing Thomas Jefferson at you. But think about this. Jefferson, we know, is a great mind. What was interesting is 14 years after he wrote the Declaration of Independence, he wrote a letter to a guy named Charles Clay in 1790. And in this letter, think about it, Jefferson, the visionary of the Declaration, writes this, and I'll give you three lines from this letter. He said, the ground of liberty is to be gained by inches. We must be content with what we can get from time to time and eternally press forward for what is yet to get. It takes time to persuade men even to do what is for their own good. Now, therein lies, I think, a big part of our challenge. So the dissatisfaction that the governor just described, that notion of fairness that Anne just described, people have to say, all right, I'm willing to take a small step towards a goal that is aspirational. And if we can measure that and value that, we're gonna be much better off. But if we say, hey, I'm, my team won in November, I have an expectation that this gets done quickly, we're gonna be continually dissatisfied. We have, I think one notion is, is that there's a violation of principles vis-a-vis -vis justice or fairness. And I think one thing that you're pointing to is this disjuncture between people's expectations of the performance of government and what the government, by design, is actually capable of doing. And to the extent that they aren't synchronizing, we're not getting things at this kind of clip because that's what we expect, but because we have a set of institutions that impede effective forthright immediate action, then that leads to rising discontent cynicism, populism, question mark? Let me give you uh, an example from the news in the past two weeks. So in Ukraine just recently, there was a populist election. President-elect Zelensky, a comedian, um, ran a populist race, didn't really debate much, took on the, pres the incumbent president, Petro Poroshenko. The hard no re-elect for Poroshenko going into that race was 53%. In other words, 53% of the public said, I will never vote for Petro Poroshenko for president. And Zelensky won like three to one in the, one -off, in the runoff race. But the backstory is fascinating. For five years, Ukraine has kept their nose above water from an economic point of view, have fought the Russians to a stalemate in a, in a, in a very aggression, aggressive Russian move in the east. They have decoupled themselves from Russia as it relates to... Um, energy, and they did pulled basically a coup with the Orthodox Church, decoupling from Russia again. You would have thought that Poroshenko would have a great thing to run on, but only 9% of Ukrainians were satisfied with where they were. Now, I sound like I'm Poroshenko's spokesman, but, um, but my point is to take a look at this and sort of measure these things and realize, oh, you know, if you take a longer view and take an incremental step, there's something that's more to celebrate. But people are not willing to do that. And I think that's the reality of where we are. So we at the Harris School just did a poll along with the Associated Press um, and NORC and asked a set of questions about trust in government, the performance of government. Um, and when you ask the American public, uh, do you believe that you can trust the government all or most of the time? 13% of people come back and say, give a thumbs up. When you ask about the need for systemic change, fully 55% of Americans think that, quote, major change is needed to our politics. And another 12% think we ought to scrap the system altogether and start over. So you're, you're talking to all told about two in three, right, Americans who, who are deeply dissatisfied with the state of our institutions. Is this, is this a unique feature of American politics? Or are these undercurrents? Do you, do you observe them in Mexico? Um, in my opinion, it's happening in, in many countries. And I would like to mention, especially being here at the Harris School, uh, regarding your question, uh, the relationship between public policy and politics. Uh, because the, 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 the people is uh, losing uh, uh, confidence in, in, in expert knowledge. Um, and expert knowledge can improve uh, uh, decisions. Um, uh, I would say that uh, 
even if it's not a, a, a new question, the relationship between public policy analysis and, and politics is important today. Uh, for example, uh, I wanted to be a, a public policy analyst. That is the reason uh, for, 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 for which I, I came to the Harris School. Um, what matters today in, in the political arena uh, is the, the, the satisfaction uh, of society. Uh, people is not very interested in evidence because evidence is not persuasive. So if you have the elements to make better, to, to make better decisions, but if that elements are not useful to win elections, you have to uh, select another option in order to make public policy more effective. What can we do to make public policy more effective? I believe that uh, one must somehow to get into politics. I know that it doesn't sound very attractive for many people. Uh, and I think that uh, it's a dilemma. But uh, as a former student of the Harris School, I think that it's a dilemma that sooner or later uh, you have to solve. Uh, it happened to me mm -hmm. like around 10 years ago. Uh, I wanted to be a policy analyst. And, now you're and a I'm a politician now. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, uh, I think that the, the main question is, how can we make evidence uh, relevant in the electoral arena? It, it, it's like, uh, it's a metaphor. It's not exact. Uh, but I think it's illustrative. It's like uh, 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 going to the doctor. Uh, you don't feel very well, so you go to the doctor, a very, a, a very good doctor. The doctor uh, uh, runs uh, uh, clinical test, uh, gives you a prescription, and after some days, uh, uh, the clinical test uh, indicate uh, that uh, your health is improving. B but you don't have that feeling. So you start uh, 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 calling the doctor, and the, the doctor is telling you, please do not overreact, you, 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 you're fine. No, doctor, I don't feel that. So you keep calling the doctor and keep calling the doctor, and he stops uh, uh, answering your calls. Uh, and at the same time, and, and you become anxious, and at the same time you have a friend who's telling you, you know, I think that that doctor is not making any good to you. You know, I, I think that those clinical tests, uh, they, 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 they have to be scientific. Well, I don't know. Um, I don't think that they are reliable. Um, the worst thing is that that friend is telling you that the doctor is trying to take in advantage of you that is trying to make some benefit out of your illness. And that is just unacceptable. So you start, uh, uh, you stop uh, trusting the doctor. And I think th th that is the, the, the current situation uh, 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 that illustrates the relationship uh, between uh, expert knowledge uh, people who know uh, evidence, uh, better decisions uh, uh, that can have an impact in society, and the electoral arena. Um, and does this resonate in thinking about, again, the issue of immigration in Europe and Eastern Europe? You, you alluded to earlier ways in which populists who in many ways in their rhetoric, take a, a, um, not just a formal, but a, a metaphorical um, stance against the expert class, right? So-called experts, the political establishment, whatnot. And, but it's not in the service of 
advancing a responsible conversation that hasn't happened yet. It's more in the service of disruption and, and not grappling with, in this case, huge populations mo movements that, that require well, hard, hard answers. You know, I suppose if you're a populist politician, you can make charges. Or if you're a talking head on TV, uh, you can make charges and then just keep moving on to your next sort of un, um, uh, untethered uh, claim. And meanwhile, working in the State Department, I was constantly being handed reports by well-meaning people, non-governmental organizations, sometimes think tanks, um, academics. And this is something that we, you know, we've talked about with the setting up of the Pearson Institute, is how do you produce not just information, but then turn that into information into something useful to an assistant secretary of state who's running from meeting to meeting to meeting and, and, and looks at it and says, gee, I, this is important. I'll have to read that someday. And then, you know, finds it later when she's packing at her office. So, uh, so that's the key is, you know, how do you take the real information, use it and have it on hand when you want to rebut some of these sort of really sweeping but um, irresponsible charges that get thrown around in our own uh, blogosphere and our own television and, uh, and, and, and so on. I think we've got to be careful to make sure that we're not casting too big of a shadow and giving too much credit to populism. And the, so just a word of caution, that is when people are rationally working together, many times it just doesn't get a lot of attention. And this is sort of a weakness of the, the media model that we have right now. Let me give you a couple of specific examples. Um, last year, Congress dealt with the opioid crisis on a bipartisan basis and came together and wrestled with some very complicated and controversial issues as it relates to treatment formulas and various approaches and funding and money and law enforcement and so forth, came together was signed into law by Donald Trump, and I will predict that in 10 years' time, we will, as a nation, be having a different and better conversation about opioids than we're having today. Why? Because of this bipartisan solution. Now, that didn't get much attention at all. Or similarly, I, I worked uh, myself hard on a um, on civil asset forfeiture reform on a bipartisan basis, move this through vis-a-vis uh, -vis the IRS, or some changes that took place late last year in revisiting sentencing laws in our criminal justice system. Again, both sides came together in ways that five years ago were impossible. It was like there was no way this thing was gonna happen, and yet now we're able to, to celebrate that. And yet the celebration was fairly muted. So my, my pitch, my appeal is uh, we need to be measured by populism, we need to be sobered by it, we need to be cautioned about it, but we ought not give it more, uh, more attention that it deserves because there is an underlying infrastructure of rational thought on a bipartisan basis and finding common ground on issues that have been fairly complicated to deal with. Would you say that our popular not populist, our popular understanding of goings on within Congress is, well, it mischaracterizes the level of meaningful dialogue that may be happening, the kind of, there's actual deal making that's going on. Yeah, that's meaningful. Is it, is it, is it sold down the river, Congress, or are we doing all right? You are provoking me right now. I'm trying um, to. <laughs> so, uh, look, I live the happy life of low expectations, and so, um, but I think, I think most people view Congress and they, they, they see an institution that's just fraught with conflict. And if all you were doing was watching Fox News, CNN, or MSNBC, you would think that people are just at one another's throats. I was just in London on Tuesday talking to uh, a, a, a group there and we were staring at one another as if we were zoo animals because they were looking at, at us trying to figure out what in the world is going on here. And I said, you are all the freak show in terms of Brexit. We can't figure you people out. And, um, and yet with, within the institution, that I served, I know, and I can, I, I can bear witness to the fact that there is much more bipartisan work that's happening, and the, relations, the relationships are much more endearing, frankly, than um, the, the cable pitch would, would indicate. 
And in foreign policy making more generally, should we, when you think about the foreign policy establishment, not the sort of folks who are elected, but people working in the State Department, in the Defense Department, long-standing career civil servants, is there a level of kind of rationality and hard-minded thinking, a place where an evidence can take hold and inform decision-making such that these populist currents, and this isn't the only political current, but it's a prominent one that we're observing now, can be sort of deflected, or do we see it embedding in the bureaucracy as well? Not a good situation right now at Say the more. State Department. Yep. Um, but we have a, a, you know, a colleague, a fellow alumnus, who is um, in the State Department serving in Zambia from the class of 2004. So he, he'd be probably more ready to answer this than I would. What I'm doing is I'm hanging out at Georgetown and watching all the senior people from the State Department come take a year off or retire and come. And, and, and I was standing in the in the um, lobby of the Foreign Service School, and I said to the dean, look at all these ambassadors we have here. He said, yes, we have more ambassadors than the State Department. And so that's not a good sign, actually. Um, what, what's happening is that I think there's large parts of US relations with other countries that if they're off the political radar screen, you have capable ambassadors, you have really good um, Americans who have been trained to work with these other countries who put in long days and who care very much about what they're doing. At the top, we have very disruptive policies coming out of the White House, and we have policy making by tweet. And so the people who I think have the hardest times are the ones who have developed a, a plan have it signed off by somebody at a senior level, a cabinet officer, and then it's sort of upset by tweet. And so that, that makes it difficult. What I thought was interesting was what we were talking before. You said that in Mexico they, you, that uh, a lot of government officials are learning to screen out some of the sort of volcanic eruptions that take place and instead focus on sort of the enduring parts of the U.S.-Mexican relationship. Is that true? Uh, the, the, the relationship between Mexico and the U.S. is a very complex. And currently, the United States is in a kind of a re-election environment. Uh, so uh, in, in, in Mexico, uh, the, the, the uh, main uh, uh, thinking is that the very strong links, the very strong relationship between Mexico and the U.S. is what matters, not the, 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 the political arguments that uh, we uh, understand as uh, related ex exclusively to the uh, domestic uh, uh, electoral arena in, in the U.S. Um, uh, we have a, 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 a very uh, deep relationship, uh, commercially, economically, uh, and the, the, the main problem currently is uh, immigration, especially from Central America, uh, passing through Mexico, uh, up to uh, uh, our northern border, US southern border. But I, I'd like to mention something uh, very quickly, which is uh, uh, my point of view as a former student of the Harris School, uh, especially uh, uh, um, related to the relationship between uh, uh, how to make public policy more effective. Uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, you have to go to talk to the people. You have to, to go to the communities. <laughs> to get to know uh, their problems, their uh, interests, and uh, making uh, those problems the subject of, of your analysis. Uh, to get into politics somehow, uh, you don't have to run for an office, but you have to uh, uh, get into politics to uh, make your points and to try to make public policy more influential. Uh, 
I think that a, a great analysis uh, based on hard evidence is not enough to make public policy uh, effective. Uh, and I think that but by doing that, uh, we, are not, we are not only going to uh, have an, a, a, an improvement in the public decision making, but also I think that we are going to improve the quality of our democracy itself. We have time for one last question. You've already answered it. Um, I, I'm eager. We, this is a school that has placed bets on producing students who care a whole lot about data, who take policy issues really seriously, think analytically, think rigorously. And we're in a political environment wherein expertise is often marginalized wherein, I'll keep pointing to populism as a, an emblematic force, doesn't encourage serious-minded thinking about the problems at hand. There's a lot of sort of division and, and sort of sweeping rhetoric. If, if you had, if you were to offer some advice to the graduate students who are coming through the program here who want to go out and make a difference, right, and have share in the, the, the importance of expertise, but who want to be effective, what, what would you say to them? I guess one piece is that you sometimes can't control timing. So you can do great work and then think, wouldn't it be great if this led to change overnight? And instead, you may find that um, the, the political environment's not ready for change yet. But that doesn't mean your work isn't great or that your work won't eventually be influential. And so you have to think about that second piece the advocacy piece, uh, the sales piece, the marketing piece, the marketing of your own ideas. Um, if you're not good at it, you need partners who can take those ideas and run with them. But for me, I think it's great if you, what, what I always felt um, trying to get uh, members of Congress and, and uh, officials inside the government when I was an advocate for the International Rescue Committee, what I always felt is if we had a really strong anecdote, a moving story, and we paired it with the evidence, that was a really powerful combination. But just having the data in a dry and lifeless form, you know, without, without the moving story, without the journalist, without the artist uh, illustrating the stories, that then you're really missing something that gets people to sit up and notice. I would have three pieces of advice for the, for the, for the graduates. One is avoid zero-sum game politics. That is the notion that the only way that you can, quote, win is if your opponent loses. It's pretty dark. It doesn't, it doesn't end well. The second thing is learn, and it's related, learn to take yes for an answer. What a delightful thing. Say yes when something comes along that's fairly reasonable, even if it's not, if it's not the whole thing. And then I think and, uh, this would be true for, for Harris graduates because the subtext is, hey, this is a smart group of people, and they are. There's a danger that flashes into elitism if, that if you marinate in that a little bit too much. And so I think that there's a winsomeness with which people can do things. And I go back to uh, a quote that's attributed to St. Ambrose from the fourth century. This was in the context of his faith, but you can imagine this applying in a lot of other circumstances. He said, we don't impose on the world, we propose a more excellent way. And I think if you're making a proposal that is so much easier for people to hear and gather around as an invitation, as opposed to a declaration of, oh, we've got this figured out, here's the data, and if you don't understand this, then you're just obtuse. Which brings us back to, Marker, your point that the, uh, underscoring the importance of engagement with the people who you ostensibly want to represent, right? That you need to, we need to have meaningful conversation and dialogue that's going on. Um, well, we've had some here. Uh, let's thank our guests and thank all of you. Yeah.